Well, thank you very much, Stephen. It's a pleasure to be at CEDA. I think I've been speaking at CEDA Political and Economic Outlook since the late 70s. I was a trustee of CEDA in the early 80s. Um, in those days, they used to give you a coaster, a set of coasters for your speech. And a few years ago, I was moving house and I found about a foot and a half high pile of silver coasters from Zeta. <laughs> I'm not sure how many I've still got. I've got some, though. I know that. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. I've um, been given the dubious task of talking about the economic and political outlook. Um, I thought I might start by referring to an experience with... Uh, the 36th President of the United States, uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson, who um, was known as a pretty rough and tumble sort of president. He was put into the presidency, of course, in the worst circumstances, sworn in on Air Force One after the assassination of John F. Kennedy on his way back to Washington. Uh, but he turned out to be a very effective president because he knew how to handle Congress, unlike most of the ones since. He was a, a, a creature of the Congress and he could get legislation through. So. He got things like civil rights through the Congress when I don't think Kennedy, for example, would have been able to do it. And he made some quite definitive statements about their exposure to the war in Vietnam and then opted out of continuing in that process. But I most remember him for a particular statement he made to his then chairman of his Council of Economic Advisers, a professor from Harvard named John Kenneth Galbraith. And he said to Galbraith one day, he said, John, have you ever thought that making a speech in economics is very much like pissing down your leg. Seems awfully hot to you, but rarely so to anybody else. <laughs> and I guess against that background, I'll be very careful as to how much data I use and how much... I've been forecasting, analysing economies since my days in the IMF in the late 60s, early 70s. And I would say without exaggeration, this is the most difficult period I can remember to say what might happen next, where the economies of the world may go. I mean, over that period, I think I've been able to pick most of the major turning points, the recessions, the stock market crashes, the GFC, um, and a host of other changes, collapse of Bretton Woods system and so on. But right now, the uncertainties are greater than they've ever been, in my mind. And it's much harder to have a view, a firm view, about where the world economy will go, let alone where we might fit ourselves into that in terms of the Australian context. And a lot of reasons for that, I guess. Um, the orders of magnitude in terms of policy changes are much bigger than we ever imagined they'd be. I remember in the uh, 80s uh, teaching at New South Wales University, we used to have uh, a subject called the limits of fiscal policy where we used to say that you couldn't change the budget deficit more than a couple of percentage points of GDP. It would be politically intolerable, yet in the GFC, in response to the GFC, I think Ireland moved at something like 14 points, percentage points of GDP. We went from surplus at two to a minus six or something. Huge orders of magnitude, unprecedented in our experience. We've also experienced much greater volatility in foreign exchange markets and, and, and bond markets and, and so on, uh, financial markets generally, than, than we came, became used to for most of the, the period, uh, post-war period. Uh, and I guess uh, the um, economic profession has been pretty divided about what we should do. <clears throat> One extreme, of course, you've had those who've argued a very strong case for austerity. And at the other extreme, you've had people like Paul Krugman saying, well, if you go down that path, you'll turn what would otherwise be a recession into a depression. And uh, if you look at around the globe today, you see how many alternative attempts there have been at policy shifts over very long periods of time without any of the expected results. I mean, I think probably uh, the monetary authorities of Europe, the United States, Japan in particular, have tried just about every conceivable monetary policy. And yet we sit in Europe today... Uh, still on the verge of a recession, some more than six years since the GFC, um, and the concern is about deflation. And they think the response to deflation is put even more liquidity into the system through quantitative easing. And there's a whole string of countries, I actually took a list of them out today, that uh, if I go through, I've got uh, Germany, um, Finland, Austria, Netherlands, France, Belgium, Slovakia, Sweden and Denmark have all got negative two-year rates. Now, I can remember when I was a PhD student, one of my colleagues had his thesis thrown out of the university because in his model there was an implicit assumption that interest rates could be negative and they thought that was inconceivable. And here we are fighting deflation 
seriously fighting deflation with negative interest rates in a number of those countries. And you only have to look at Japan to get a, an idea of what might happen. Nobody picked at the end of the 80s that Japan, the success story, economic success story of the whole post-war period, would move into more than two decades of rolling recessions and deflation despite negative interest rates, zero, near zero on negative interest rates throughout most of that period, a multiplicity of fiscal packages, stimulatory packages, a multiplicity of prime ministers, and they're still there, and they're still trying, and they're still trying to pump even more money into the economy with debt at about 220, 230% of GDP. I mean, uh, as I say, a lot of the relationships we might have taken for granted in our economic classes no longer seem to apply. Flooding the world with liquidity, for example, didn't bring about <laughs> runaway inflation, even though uh, some central banks, particularly our own, were most concerned about that. Not to say that at some point it won't happen, but uh, we've fallen into this world where now the answer's been more and more quantitative easing, which I think has probably surprised everyone is that it hasn't stimulated much economic activity. Uh, you haven't seen much pickup in, in consumer confidence and spending. You certainly haven't seen very much business investment around the world. But it has contributed, uh, I think, significantly in three ways. One, it's accentuated inequality. Two, it's underwritten some asset bubbles around the world. And three, it's expanded debt levels when uh, a lot of the concern going into the GFC was the, the debt levels we've seen. So very significant challenges, I think, in just looking at the world. And uh, when I look at the euro and see how relative countries in the euro have fared in this uh, period, I, I'm, I'm really, again, quite staggered. I mean, obviously, Germany's done OK, even though they're not far out of recession either these days, obviously influenced a lot by the collapse of the Soviet Union's economy, but of the of Russian economy, I should say. But um, they've benefited enormously from having a very artificially low exchange rate. And uh, compared to other countries, like Greece at the other extreme, for example, which has suffered enormously by the value of the euro. It's interesting to think about a country in the euro and a country out. Take Spain and the UK, for example, going into the GFC, they had similar levels of government debt to GDP. Yet the way they could respond to the crisis was very different. There was a run on Spanish bonds or their international indebtedness, their central bank couldn't stand behind those bonds, they had to rely on the European Central Bank, which didn't respond very quickly. Yet in the UK, of course, the Bank of England could stand behind the bond market. But more importantly, the Spanish economy couldn't, be, couldn't get the benefit of depreciating its currency, whereas, of course, in the UK, there was a 25 or 30% depreciation in response to the GFC. And the relativities are quite significant. Now you've got the UK making a reasonably significant recovery, having had some austerity, having, having had some structural reform, but a reasonably significant recovery. And the Spanish economy is still languishing close to recession or in recession, 25% unemployment rates, 50% youth unemployment rates, and uh, no medium-term prospect of getting out of it. I guess the focus, one final point on Europe, is on Greece. And it's interesting to see that the Political spectrum, another thing that's happened is political tolerance has been eroded. We've seen a bit in, in, in recent days in this country, but the capacity to continue a program of austerity runs a limit. And the Greek economy is a good, one, a good example because they had a recession for about six years, which resulted in about a 25% cut in their GDP. They started out the GFC, post-GFC with a debt of about 130, 140% of GDP. Today it's 175% of GDP, the problem's getting bigger, yet the pain that they've endured in terms of cuts to government spending, cuts to public sector employment, uh, emigration and so on has been very, very significant. And you've seen a government come into power in the last few weeks which is promising an end to austerity, trying to renegotiate its debt position with the, with the Troika but particularly the Europeans, and that's a big ask. The Germans are naturally resisting that because the way they see it, somebody in a German factory, probably an old East European factory, has to work longer and harder in the manufacturing sector so some Greek bureaucrat can retire early on a generous pension. The social tensions within Greece are enormous because of the pain they've borne under austerity. The tensions within Europe are very real. And of course, in economic terms, there's a quite an interest as to whether Grexit will take place, whether Greece will actually exit the euro. Now, most of the Greeks, when surveyed, don't want to leave the euro. Uh, 
I personally don't think it would make much difference. They'd be better off outside the euro with the flexibility of an exchange rate to offset some of the other issues that they're, they're addressing. But these are very real pressures. There's not too much clear economic theory or guidance coming out of any of that discussion. And, um, you know, and they are fighting, as I say, teetering on the brink of recession, fighting deflation, but still trying to do the same sort of things they've done for quite some time. And I think Einstein used the definition of insanity once, that you keep doing the same thing in the same way and expect different results. I don't think you're going to get it in this case. And the pressures in Europe are very real. Of course, in the US, they've actually had more success in a recovery phase. To some extent, you'd have to say quantitative easing did work in sort of at least stimulating part of the economy, particularly the you know, construction sector and so on. But again, you know, it's contributed enormously to inequality. It's risked an asset bubble, and indebtedness haven't really been, hasn't really been solved. And now the transition that's of, of interest is how do they move from a world where they ended quantitative easing to actually start tightening? If there's an asset bubble in the US stock market, for example, how big a correction are you going to get when they start raising interest rates? How much of a shakeout might you get in the bond market? How much of a shakeout might you get in the currency market when so many countries are trying to drive their currencies down to get some competitive edge as a way of trading out of these circumstances? These are very significant questions to which we don't have too many answers. I remember when Bernanke first announced that they'd end tapering, the uh, emerging the stock markets and, and, um, and currencies of most of the major emerging markets fell by somewhere between 10 and 20 per cent because they'd been beneficiaries of cheap money in the US coming in and making fairly speculative investments in their countries against their currency values. Now, how much more of a shakeout is there going to be? Maybe the transition will go smoothly. Not too many management experiences you can draw on in the last 50 or 100 years that would help you handle this set of circumstances. The risk is a stock market correction, a bond market shakeout, some currency readjustment. And uh, so these are very big risks. Finally, just briefly on Japan, I've mentioned what uh, I think is an amazing situation for that country. But uh, I guess across all three of those, we've had paucity of structural reform, very bad political structures, no, not supportive of, of, uh, of, of good government. Unlike this country, where I think today we're in day nine of good government, I mean, you've, you're not getting good government in these other countries. Finally, a brief comment on China. China's obviously slowing. Um, who knows what the growth number is? I was in China a few years ago and they announced the growth rate for the September quarter in the middle of the month of September. So I was fairly nervous about what that meant because we couldn't do that till the first week of December. It's clearly slowed from the double digit numbers to six or seven percent. I hosted a Chinese delegation recently at the university, a very senior government delegation in the area of climate change. They're working on growth numbers of four or five percent in their modelling for the 2020s. We are moving in that direction reasonably quickly, probably quicker than they've been prepared to admit. But that's a very significant constraint on us. And as the growth rate slows in China, the structural weaknesses of the Chinese economy become evident. The massive inequality, the difficulty of making a transition from, a, from a, um, an investment-based economy, where investment's been as high as 50 60 per cent of GDP, to a consumption-based economy. Uh, the problems in the shadow banking sector and, and, and non-performing non -performing loans. Uh, these are very significant structural issues that, uh, that are coming to the fore at the present time. So just briefly for the Australian point of background of the Australian point of view, those risks are bigger than I think are acknowledged in most Treasury documents I've read in the last several years. They, don't, they mention them, you know, the Treasury strategy. You've got a paragraph, you mentioned it. So therefore, you've taken account of it, but you haven't actually factored in the reality of some of that, of those circumstances unfolding from our point of view. And consistently, Treasury's got those key international related numbers wrong, the terms of trade, the revenue consequences, they've got them wrong. They've got them wrong on the upside when the resources boom is giving more revenue than the government ever believed was possible. Now they're getting them wrong on the downside when the revenue is actually much weaker than they, they dare to predict in, in any budget. So against that background, you know, in a sense, you might say, who wants to be in government in this country? Because it's a very significant challenge. And uh, we've had this drift in politics in Australia since a bloke named Houston in the early 90s who dared to lay out all the detail of policy in, in thousands of pages of detail, now universally accepted as the longest political suicide note in history. <laughs> but having said that, 
we've become such a ridiculous small target strategy on either side of politics to the point where they aren't prepared to say very much at all. The last election campaign was a series of dot points for policies. You know, stop the boats and fix the budget and create two million jobs and don't ask me how any detail about any of that. At the same time, I promised to increase all this government spending on national disability, national broadband, um, um, Gonski, and a host of infrastructure projects. And at the same time, I'll lower corporate tax and I'll lower personal tax and shit, I can even see that doesn't add up. But that's the, the ridiculous extent to which we've come in this country where both sides of politics are playing that game. And uh, unfortunately, it's done two things. It's certainly bred some of these minority parties that have found a way into the Senate and an influence in policy. It's bred an intolerance in the electorate who now are going to no two-term governments anymore. If you don't perform in one term, you're out. Uh, and uh, I think that's a very, very significant shift. But more importantly, and neither of them are looking at it, the standing of both major political parties in the eyes of the electorate has collapsed. They see it as a... It's, it's short-term, it's opportunistic, it's negative, it's, it's a, in many cases, personal political game played out in the media to win the media every day. No long-term structural thinking, no long-term policy, no detail, uh, and in a circumstances where particular vested interest groups have been able to exercise an undue influence on government decision-making. So the electorate is actually voting, I believe, with their feet saying we don't like either major political party. And that's evident in state result, election results. It's evident in the rerun of the Senate election in, uh, in uh, Western Australia after the last election. It's, it's evident, uh, obviously, in the composition of the Senate. These are very significant constraints on what we can realistically expect to happen. Okay, against that background, we see a budget brought down last year, which, as Steve said, was universally sort of condemned as inequitable. I remember I was sitting on the ABC radio live listening to the budget speech, looking at some numbers in front of me, and immediately said, I can't believe this. I mean, there's about a 12%, 15% cut in the disposable income of people at the bottom, and there's less than 1% cut in the disposable income of people towards the top end of the spectrum. It will be damned as inequitable. And why? For two reasons. One, it was inequitable, and two, because the expectation was created that it wouldn't be. One of the commitments that was made by Joe Hockey and Abbott and others in the run-up to the election, in the release of the Audit Commission and so on, was, look, this is a budget emergency, we've got to take some tough decisions, but don't worry, we'll be fair, we'll be equitable, we'll spread the burden across the Australian community. Now, if you only look at government expenditure and you focus on things like welfare payments and benefits, you are naturally going to hit the lower income groups. If you leave out the tax expenditures on the other side, which are about $120 billion. They've stopped putting that number in the Treasury documents now, at $120, $130 billion, but growing much faster. And they're concentrated in housing, they're concentrated in superannuation, they're concentrated in the GST. If you don't touch those, you don't have any really easy way within normal government expenditure to bring about an equitable outcome. And then if at the same time when you announce a policy, you don't explain why or what you're on about, you shouldn't be surprised that you get slammed. For example, you announce a, a co-payment for health, the revenue for which doesn't actually go to fix the Medicare system is supposed to be broken, but with no health policy within which to understand what that co-payment's meant to do, how it's supposed to work. The ground wasn't prepared, people didn't sign off on the, on the policy challenge, and then, of course, they got hit with a surprise. Same with university fees and the change to HECS. Where's the higher education policy within which I can understand these things? And then if you take a more broader view than that, where was the overarching narrative that said, in a new government, this is what we're on about, this is how we're going to handle these circumstances. We're making a transition from an economy based on the resources sector to whatever. What is the whatever? How are we going to get there? Where are those two million jobs going to come from? I can count nearly 900,000 people registered unemployed and about 160,000 job vacancies. I think there's an issue here. You have to explain yourself in an overarching narrative sense there's no focus, no structure to any of that. So I think that um, a lot of damage has been done to a new government, which has burnt an enormous amount of political capital. And you say to yourself, well, what can they do now? Overlay that a sort of pseudo leadership challenge of the last week or so, and uh, ask yourself, what can you reasonably expect will come out of this process? And it's not just, in my mind, simply a question of changing the jockey. The horse is crook. <laughs> 
the horse is not running very well. You have to look at the structure of government and the processes of government. And we have burnt that process in the last 20 odd years. The process of reform in so many areas has not been embraced by either side of politics. Uh, issues have been left, left basically to drift and to grow, become more significant. If they ever become a crisis, of course, they will react in some way. But at this stage, um, we haven't seen any of that sort of leadership. And how do you break out of that mould? How do you get somebody out of the 24-hour media cycle where they think it's important to actually hit the other side? And when I look at the Abbott government, the big change to me that surprised me was that they were so unprepared for government in the sense that they weren't ready to make the transition from being uh, probably a world-class opposition, certainly the best opposition we'd ever had in this country, in terms of their capacity to undermine and destroy a government, but they haven't been able to make a transition from that to the process of governing. Because in opposition, you can get away with playing politics. And you play a lot of politics, and they do. I didn't, but they, they did. Uh, I got criticised because I tried to set the agenda and be constructive and support them when they were doing the right thing. Today, that would be considered insane. But it did help us to, you know, reform the financial system and the, and the protection and you know, a host of other things in terms of external policy and so on. But today, the game has been in opposition. You're negative, you oppose, you disagree. OK, but when you get into government, that doesn't apply anymore. You don't stand there all the time blaming the other side. You can't stand there saying that it's all their fault. Sure, they've done it and it is their fault. But the emphasis is on policy. It's on governing. It's on solving problems. And we aren't seeing any of that. And I don't think changing either side of politics is going to see much change unless somebody's prepared to stand up and actually set the agenda and actually start to govern. And that's a very complicated process that we haven't seen in a long time. But you have to start by getting an electorate sign-off, if you like, on the, on the challenge, on the problem, the magnitude of the problem, what's involved. Second stage, you've got to be prepared to lay out the options, pluses and minuses. And third stage is then you have to pick one of those as your policy and get out there and educate and defend. And I don't see that there's much chance of that happening in current circumstances on either side of politics. Yet, in terms of the magnitude of the uncertainty that I see internationally and the challenges that we have in this country, and you can go any area of public policy, they are very significant, real challenges that have been left adrift. I think the challenge is enormous. Thank you.